And since we have newcomers, I'm going to reveal uh, a little bit if you, if Krishna and Krishna don't mind, right? And uh, we're still in our uh, first chapter. And so let's go to the table of contents, see how the book is uh, organized. It's here. Uh, so this um, book is organized around the theme of uh, bodhicitta. So bodhicitta means the mind of awakening. And so in the beginning, so the, the author tell us, you know, the excellency of bodhicitta. So if, if we generate this mind, what's the benefits? And so he tried to encourage us to generate this mind of awakening. And once we have this mind in the generated in us, and then the next, I think the next three chapter, and he trying to say, hey, once you have this mind, how do you have this mind maintain, not just let it disappear? How do you maintain this mind and make it grow? And so the second chapter, the confession, and the third one, take hold of um, bodhicitta. So she's tried to uh, teach us the way to nourish this mind, because this mind of bodhicitta, when, when it's generated, it's, it's like a like a young plant, right? So we, we, we all like plant something. So when the little uh, sprouts just come out, it's very, very tender. You need to take care and protect the little uh, young plant. And so this is the way. And the next few chapter two, the, the, there's different, different aspects. Uh, how do you go deeper in the path and how do you make this plant from the little young plot, young sprouts to a, like something stronger. You can even grow into a bigger tree. You can, you can benefit a lot of people. And so we have this uh, like vigilant introspection, patience and diligence, uh, meditative uh, concentration, wisdom. So all those are the six aspects of paramita. I don't know if you guys heard about paramita. So for the path of Bodhisattva, they have they need they need to um, develop six kind of paramita. So these different chapters uh, address one aspect of the paramita, and the the last one, the dedication. You want to dedicate the merit to to a good course, and meaning to to all to all lives to all all sensuous beings, right? So that's the structure. And so where we are is, um, so the section we are at is should bodhicitta come to birth? And here he talked about there's two kinds of bodhicitta. So bodhicitta, the awakened mind is known in brief to have two aspects. First, aspiring bodhicitta in intention, then active bodhicitta, practical engagement. So the training of uh, generating the mind of bodhicitta, we start from like, I want to have this, aspire. So even though I'm not there yet, I'm not really, um, I, I really don't have the capacity to do, to do something at this point. So at least this is something I want, aspiring. Like all of us, like we, we are here, you know, we, we learn this text, right? Because this is something we want. We want to uh, transform our mind from like ordinary, you know, little person's mind to a like to a noble to a noble mind, like something we aspire. So that's the first stage. So we train our mind to aspire to have this mind of awakening, and so once we have this aspiring bodhicitta, we call sort of stabilized, and then. Next stage is the active bodhicitta, uh, practical engagement. So here he he also uses several metaphors. Just tell us, you know, why we want to have this um, mind of mind of awakening. Why would we want to aspire to that? So he talk about different uh, as different uh, benefits. You said several uh, metaphor. Um, so that's the part we went through before. He used several metaphor to 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 say how great this mind is. I think last time we read this part. So if this mind is with uh, kindly generosity, and so I'm, I'm going to read this one. So we, we actually today we need to start with um, verse 26. So I'm going to read the few verses before. And so that you know, we, we, we sort of have a continuity. And so if 
with kindly generosity, one merely has the wish to soothe the aching heads of other beings. Such merit knows no bounds. No need to speak then of the wish to drive away the endless pain of each and every living being, bring them unbounded excellence. Could our father or our mother even have so generous a wish? Do, do the very gods, the Rashis, even Brahma, harbor such benevolence as this? For in the past, they never even in their dreams wished something like this even for themselves. How could they do so for another's sake? The aim to bring benefits of beings, a benefit that others wish not even for themselves, this noble Jew-like state of mind arises truly wondrous, never seen it before. So, so this author here says, so this mind of uh, bodhicitta, mind of bodhicitta meaning uh, I wish, I wish all living beings to be happy, to be happy and peaceful. And so this this mind, mo most most us, right? Most people never even think of before. So in in our mind, in, in like for twenty four hours, we think about ours, we think about us, we think of about our family, we think about our our mind, sort of restricted to the little word we know. And so the mind of Buddhichitta is a boundless, right? A boundless compassion, boundless love. And you, you wish everyone to have this perfect happiness. And so he was saying this um, mind to bring benefits of beings. And so this mind, even those gods, Bahamas, they never even had that before. And so if we have this mind, it's gonna be truly uh, wondrous. And so that's way covered last time. And now we come to verse 26. And I'm going to go to the commentary one. 126. So Krishna, do you want to read, start from verse 20, 126, chapter one, 20, verse 26, right? The pen dispelling, right? Wait, uh, verse 26? Yeah, so I, I have my on my screen. The verse, pain, yeah. Okay, the pain dispelling draft. This cause of joy for those who wander through the world, the precious attitude, jewel of mine, how shall I be gorged or quantified? What is comparable to this pain dispelling draft? What is comparable to this pain dispelling draft? It's excellent medicine of Bodhicitta frees us from self-centeredness, bringing us relief and a loving heart. The cause of joy is found by those who wander through the world. Even we, maybe Bodhicitta, Bodhicittas don't design our lives to escape the chaos of the world. We go into the thick of things and work with whatever we find. Samsara teaches our practice ground, our boot camp, so we speak. If we find we continually get hooked into the drama, we temporarily retreat to work on ourselves. But our passion is to alleviate even greater depths of suffering and meet even great challenges with equanimity. For if the simple thought to be of help to others exceeds in words the worship of the Buddhas, what need is there to speak of the actual deeds? That bring about the Wheel and benefit of beings. 1.28. For beings long to free themselves from misery, but misery itself they follow and pursue. They long for joy, but in their ignorance destroy it as they would a hated enemy. Again, Shanti Deva praises the benefits of an ordinary altruistic thought while adding how much greater. It is to actually follow through, to help others at the most meaningful level. However, we first address our own confusion, as Shantideva points out. Although we long to be free ourselves from misery, it is misery itself we follow and pursue. We may assume we do crazy things intentionally, but in truth, these actions aren't always uh, volitional. 
our conditioning is sometimes so deep that we cause harm without even realizing it. We long for joy and we were very the very things that destroy our peace of mind again and again, we ultimately make matters worse. If we are going to help other people get free, we have to work compassionately with our own unfortunate tendencies. Shanti Deva, we will find is an expert on dismantling these repeating patterns. Those who fill with bliss or beings destitute of joy, who cut all pain and suffering away for from those weighted down with misery, who drive away the darkness of their ignorance, what virtue could be matched with theirs, what friend could be compared to them, what merit is there similar to this? <coughs> Sorry, verses 39 and 30 refer directly to the paramita or generosity, the generosity that frees us from stress and what is with there, I guess, what is. Your Set, selfishness. selfishness. According to the teachings, there are three types of generosity, three types of helping others by giving of ourselves. The first kind of generosity is giving of material things, such as food and shelter. The second is giving of fearlessness. We help those we are, who are afraid. If someone is scared of the dark, we give them a flashlight. If they are going through a fearful time, we, compare, we comfort them. If they are having Night terrors, mm -hmm. we sleep next to them. This may sound easy, but it takes time and effort and care. The third kind of generosity dives away the darkness of ignorance, that is the gift of dharma, and it is considered the most profound, although no one can eliminate our ignorance but ourselves. Nevertheless, through examples and through teachings, we can inspire and support one another. The, the inconceivable wish to help all sentient beings always brings oneself. Our own experience is... Our own experience is the only thing we have to share. Other than that, we can't pretend to be more awake or more compassionate than we actually are. Much of our relationship comes from the honest recognition of our foibilities, foibles. Inability to measure up to our own standards is decidedly humbling. It allows us to empathize with other people's difficulties and mistakes. In short, the best friend is the one who realizes our sameness and is skilled in helping us help ourselves. Uh, you want to stop and discuss a little? Sure. And go back to, I think we start from here. The pain dispelling draft, right? And so what actually, um, verse 128, so that that's really um, like for, for me, it, it's very, very profound. It says, uh, for being long to free themselves from misery, but misery itself, they follow and pursue. They long for joy, but in their ignorance, destroy it as they would a hated enemy. And so I think it's happened to a lot of us, right? I really want to be happy. Right. And this every breath we take, every wink, you know, we 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 have, it's for happiness. And because we don't have the wisdom, and sometimes even though what we do, we, we want to have happiness, and what do we um because we don't know the right course, or we don't know the right way to have happiness, and sometimes we just somehow reach the uh, the opposite destination. We want happiness, but we bring our own misery. And I think here he says, because we have this repeating patterns. So repeating patterns, even though you want something, but it, because we're not doing it the right way, and we just have the opposite effect. So what do you guys think? Which, which uh, line? Uh, yeah, I think yeah, but, um, the courses of uh, joy, um, actually, it's the courses of the happiness. Basically, it's um, not, not the way we thought, right? So the what we, what our action, what our, you know, what we are doing, basically, it's um, follow um, um habitual pattern. But this pattern, like repeating patterns, actually is not the causes of the joy. So probably, I mean, it's the causes of the 
suffering. So because we repeatedly this pattern and then to drive us to the suffer. So that's yeah. So our our intention, our intention is uh, for happiness, but our action actually bring us misery. Yeah. Yeah, because we have this pattern, (laughs) repeating pattern. Yeah. So San, Sanjay, what do you do? Do you have anything like a, any sentence like strike you? You, you have some a conquer with your mind. Well, well, I mean, I just wanted to comment in general. I was just going to say I love the idea of what you're saying about how it should be aligned. Basically, what I hear you saying is the intention and mm-hmm. the alignment of core values. And what I've noticed is that opens a wellspring. Um, I like what the other gentleman mentioned about. Uh, being charitable in terms of food and shelter. And I've been doing that this year. And what a difference. I found out that I don't really want much else other than to serve other family friends services are the best. Mm-hmm. I find that that works out really well for me. Well, good for you. So what have you been doing for like a food and shelter? Uh, so I, what I did is I gave my house away from, uh, you know, to a pastor. She was falling uh, on hard times. And so I gave my house, I, I told her not to worry about it. So I, it was a beautifully remodeled house and I put all this time, energy and love. I felt, felt that would help God's kingdom. And that's back in Ohio. Other things I've done, I've given a lot of food to food banks, a um, lot of money to charity and um, uh, settled a lot of money in terms of on um, different sides of my family, gave away a lot of money, just make, made decisions. And so in that giving, I find that I'm very filled. I find, I find that my cup is filled and that my thoughts are aligned with the sense of purity and uh, altruism. That idea that, that I'm serving others, I feel very satisfied doing that as well. Wow, that's very, very admirable. I think I, I should salute you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so like I said, your, your, your action is aligned with your core value, right? That's and right. your intention. That's and, right. And then go ahead. So how, how actually what motivates you to do this? Because what you da- you have done, give your house away, give people all those things, right? It's not it's not that easy. You need to you know overcome some sort of obstacle to do that. Be it's because to helping others is not like some for most people, it's not our natural tendency. Our natural tendency is to take care of ourselves. Right. So what happened is, I really appreciate your asking that. So what I realized, I I came into the realization that a lot of people had been helping me along the way. You see, a lot of people had been helping, pouring into me. Um, They have that African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child. I believe it takes a village to raise a family. And so there is this idea that a lot of people have gone into my success and Mm -hmm. that I'm part of the process. So I don't view anyone as non-family. So the fact that the pastor needed help, I was, I was concerned about letting, you know, I, I gave her the extensions that she asked for. And I, then there was a voice, the meditation, going to church, all that stuff helped. And the voice said, just give her the house. I said, yeah, that's what I, it was aligned with my thinking. And by surrendering, I've been making large decisions, having in, inner peace without mentally trying to figure out everything without that connection to higher source. And that's also leading me to, to Italy. So the decision is I'm giving all that away. All of a sudden I went to meditation and the voice said you'd be, um, I want you to go to Italy. And in Italy, you can pursue your art, music, teaching. And there I would be doing training sessions for free. Again, it's this idea of service. And maybe if anyone wants to give money for charitable, charitable causes, that's great, but I don't need anything. I'll have some other way to have the finances, but I love this idea of having the abundance flow and then serving where I'm needed. You follow? I just want to. Wow, you make, you make me feel so warm, even to listen to you. I don't want you to say it. <laughs> Thank you. No, you just feel like what you just said just bring different kind of energy, right? You don't hear that kind of, you know, this way very, quite, very often. Thank you. Yeah, they hear it says most people, uh, you know, they want to be happy, right? But then their, their mind just like, just focus on themselves. They want just me, 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 right? And if you have this me, 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 me attitude, even though you want happiness, but you're not going to have happiness. And so on the other hand, if you, like you said, you, 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 you expand your heart, you, you expand your giving, right? And you're not repeating the, 
the, the old pattern, whatever pattern, like no ordinary pattern, then actually you, you, you actually found like a greater bliss. Yes, I, I love that you said that. And what I found is that I'm happy anywhere with anyone at any time. I'm enjoying wherever I am learning and becoming more present by going to church and meditation and learning new things and growing my mind, like by connecting with you and others here. I love learning and growing every day. And I just, uh, I love life. I, well, I, want, to be, you know, I want to be friend with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think you're, you're my you. good uh, role model. Now you're not just like, you know, contemplate, just to, to think about all the good things you want to help others in your meditation session, you're actually doing it. Thank you. And that's yeah, because like even for the mind of Woody Chita, like like I mentioned earlier, two stages, right? One is aspiring. That's the first stage. And then once you have the aspiration, you have the intention, then you actually set to take actions and you, you are taking actions. That's really great. Right? Yeah, so this one says that our conditioning is sometimes so deep that we cause harm without even realizing it. So we long for joy and do the very things that destroy our peace of mind. So it's happened to many, many of us because our, our mind is so focused on me, 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 me. And so again, again, we unwittingly make matters worse. And so if we are going to help other people get free, we have to work compassionately with our own unfortunate tendencies. I like the word you use, unfortunate tendencies. <laughs> yeah, so we have to overcome those unfortunate tendencies. So, Krish, what do you think? This the paragraph we just read. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, see, I said I just want to thank. Uh, I know I want to come. Uh, I want to um, express my admiration for Sanjay for the kind of work he had done and the way he's doing these things. It mm -hmm. is uh, it's very admirable and uh, also being humble about it. And you know, just saying that you know, I just felt like doing it. Some people like, you know, uh, make a big deal out of this. You know, they say like they're big, great people. Like, And some people are very humble. Like Sanjay who's saying, I just did it because I just want to do it. And that's it. It's very good. And I know. I love her already. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and things like um, here, like the point here I'm trying to say is what is the thing that we keep doing again and again and again? And we see, if we look at ourselves, we always find ourselves at some point of time where mm -hmm. we are Time and again, we see ourselves, find ourselves, maybe some tears flowing through our eyes, or we are finding ourselves in a bad situation. We are happy with the way we are. We are unhappy and we feel sad. Feel like I don't want to be here, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the thing. That's so that's the point. We kind of we put ourselves in that situation. We'll have to go back, work our way through the steps, and see what mistakes were made, and then you will know what is the mistakes we are making and what is the pattern that we are repeating. And once we find that we have to eliminate it, once we eliminate it, we won't repeat it. Once we won't repeat it, we won't slip deeper into um, suffering. Yeah, so I think being aware of those unfortunate tendencies is a first step. But most of us, we're not aware of our tendencies or the repeated patterns, the patterns that, that leads us to misery instead of happens that we're seeking. And so being aware is really important. So once we're aware, so we ha I have this pattern and this pattern, every time I do this, you know, it, it, it just bring me misery. And so we want to be aware and dismantle those right. patterns. You know, there is no misery. When we know when we are in misery, if we have the awareness to identify that, hey, I am in misery at this point of time, that awareness, if we can get it, saying, mm -hmm. hey, I'm in misery, I should not be here. Once we have that awareness, we can work our way back to say, what brought me here? And what did I do to bring get me here? And then how should I, what, what should I do next time around to not get me back here? And then forget the whole thing and just brush it off and move on. Yeah, so Sanjay, uh, once you have done all the action, right, do you feel like you, yourself in a higher like energy plateau? 
Yes. And what I've oh, noticed, uh, yes, that's becoming a way of life. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I, I just want to know, like, because I think that's something got to have make you feel like different level energy once you have that action. Yes. Yeah, so I feel like if, so for example, um, with my family affairs, resolving millions of dollars in, a, in the estate, you know, and just making decisions with mm -hmm. limited information, there's a trust, there's a surrender. And I realized there's plenty to go around and to resolve karma, very similar to what the gentleman was just mentioning. Mm -hmm. And so what I found is that's opened up my heart, as you mentioned, and in the meditation, the expansion at the soul level is guiding mm -hmm. my decisions from the divine. So now it's interesting, I'm able to make what would be perceived as larger decisions more effortlessly, that I follow, I flow, the patterns that you're all speaking of are dissolving because it's giving way to new passions. Another thing that's happening is I'm reconnecting myself with childhood passions, with community, faith, family, friends, service, music, art, culture. Uh, when I was a kid, I went to Italy twice, a kid and mm -hmm. a teenager. And so now it's interesting as an adult, I'm going back with more maturity, more wisdom, and it's like a coming home, a homecoming. And what I like about Italy is my heart is expanding. My Every time it, it's mentioned, right? Or the villa, I'm seeing the villa, it's you're supposed to go there. Uh, you're going to lead free talks, motivational trainings, interview celebrities, musicians. Uh, you're gonna play your music. You're gonna learn about history, world cultures. And it's guiding me to Rome. I didn't think about that, right? Because I was thinking Florida, which I'm still open to, but that was more, um, there was a plan to go to Florida and it was more cognitive. It was perfect, I feel joy. However, the Rome, my heart really took off, it expanded. And in the same way that I'm giving it a larger scale, I'm just following what the soul is guiding me to do independent of labels. How anyone judges me or anything, I'm not concerned about that. I'm concerned about being charitable, uh, looking at the expansion within uh, and serving others and feeling really good about that. But the feeling good is independent of my doing it. It's not yeah, the reason doing I'm doing to, what to it feel is. good, right? Feel good, just a byproduct, just as just a result. Exactly. Yeah. So, are you in in Italy now? Uh, I'm going to Italy next uh, month. I was I'm going to Portugal for a week or so, ten days, and then uh, Italy for eight to nine days. And everything clicks with Italy. You understand what I'm saying? Like my heart just it's aligned. There's it's no the right place, right? Yes, right at this point, yes. So good for you. So I think what I hear is instead of listening to the voice of your little self, you actually listen to the, to, to, to listen to the voice of the higher energy. Yes, because I was going to go to Florida and I did the meditation for half an hour and the voice said, you can go to Florida. However, I want you to go to Italy. I'm like, uh, <laughs> and, and then it, it explained why. It just said, you're going to have a chance to reconnect, make friends, family. And in my heart started singing. It said, you're going, to, you're going to serve others. You'll be able to play music, the art, culture, the beaches. And yeah, I- So like, yeah, I know. I, I really, you know, <laughs> I wish you'd come back and, and, and study with us more. <laughs> so uh, thank you, I'll leave you. Uh, I'll leave you. And I think you some cut off. No, I, I was just saying thank you. And I, I love learning from all of you as well. I mean, it's very exciting. It's just interesting how when you listen to your inspiration, mm -hmm. that gives way to new thought processes that were already there. And as I believe, it's a wellspring. You know, a lot of spiritual and religious teachings teach this. It's a wellspring of joy. And what's interesting, I talked to one Christian friend here at the, at the gym where I work out, and he said the same thing, the divine connection that you have with God. And that's what I believe. Even as I'm more like text religious text from around the world what mm -hmm. i notice is that you can still have that divine connection at any time wow that's really great so i, I also like the last verse like chris read right so there's three kind of uh, generosity and uh, so there's six parameter the first parameter is generosity so the first the first kind is uh giving off material things like sanjay did right food and shelter so the second is giving a gift of fearlessness and for example, uh, if an animal is scared, you know, we instead of killing the animal and eat the animal for food, we protect that animal. So the giving the gift of fearlessness. The third kind is uh, driving away the darkness of ignorance, meaning you share 
you share wisdom, right? You, you want to light up that person's heart. So that's the gift of Dhamma. And then it's also considered most profound. And so like now we're here like learning from each other and learning this text, right? So hopefully, you know, we can drive away our own darkness of ignorance and we can also share the light with others. So that's the third kind of generosity. I also like the last paragraph. It says, the inconceivable wish to help all sensuous beings always begins with oneself. Our own experience is the only thing we have to share. Other than that, we can pretend to be more awake or more compassionate than we actually are. So much our realization come from the honest recognition of our, how do you call this? Foibles? Foibles. Foibles, right. Is that meaning faults? Yes, faults, yes. Right. Mistakes. The mistake means slippery, slippings. We slip, our uh, slippings. Okay, foibles, right. So the inability to measure up to our own standards, it's decidedly humbling. So it allows us to emphasize with other people's difficulties and mistakes. So in short, the best friend is one who realizes our sameness and is skilled in helping us, helping ourselves. Ms. Zhao, can I add something? Mm -hmm, sure. You say what you said about the sentient beings, that really has led me to go vegetarian. And I'm moving maybe towards veganism. I do have leather goods. However, the consciousness of the suffering of animals, it's been something throughout my life that really, I've noticed as I'm very sensitive, becoming more and more sensitive, it's in alignment with the core values. It's the same energy for me. No I'm not saying anything else. Right. You understand? The same charitable energy is allowing me to be charitable with all sentient beings. I want to respect life. It's the same thing with giving everything away. You understand? Something's different. Yeah, I don't I know. Do you notice that? I think that? sometimes... It's like inter right. See, I, I am in the same boat as Sanjay. I'm in the same boat, same similar situation. Turn vegetarian, trying to turn vegan, uh, trying to not use leather. <laughs> he was, this morning I was looking at a jacket and says leather. I said, should I buy it or not? <laughs> I was asking myself. And then... Exactly. Uh, and then, uh, and then, but I used to be at one point of time, a guy who used to proudly boast that I eat anything that walks. <laughs> I used to be a guy like that. And that guy is dead. <laughs> I had to kill him. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, actually my, I, I myself, I've been, I have been a vegetarian for more than 20 years, I think close 25. And it's not like something uh, forced upon myself. I just, at one point, you feel like, so people ask me, hey, why do you want to become vegetarian? And uh, I just say, you know, like I said, do others upon what others, you want others to do for you, that one. Uh, and I says, uh, I don't like to be cut. You know, somebody cut my body and, and, and I don't, and, and so I don't want to cut other people. And I don't like people to, uh, you know, just cause pain on me and eat me. And so I don't want to cause pain on others and eat others either. <laughs> So that my uh, my initial, I think uh, my initial motivation to become vegetarian is very, very simple. Just at one point, like Sanjay mentioned, you don't want to cause harm to others. Exactly. And, yeah. So when other people uh, feel painful, you feel like you 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 feel the pain too. And I, I just when you're talking about Sanjay, I just is is a thought occurred to me. It just happened um, like when you when you were talking. And so we know the essence, right? The essence of this universe or the essence of the universal truth is love, right? And, and so I think when your mind is quieter, so when you have less noise disturb your mind stream, you're more, you, you be more aligned with this universal energy. So that's the energy of love. And so when you're more aligned with this universal energy of love, and then you somehow you can live more, live up to that, like or closer to that energy. But the energy of love, the first one is no harm. And if you love someone, you don't want to cause harm to someone. So I think when your mind is quieter, you're somehow more in sync with that energy. And so without learning those doctrines, without having some, some sort of principle forced upon you by external force, so you self feel that you don't want to cause harm. It just come naturally. So when your mind is more in sync with that energy. 
I don't even make any sense. It just a thought came, came to me when I listened to Sanjay's talking. Does that make any sense? Makes a lot of sense. Thanks, Miss Al. <laughs> it just come naturally. Oh, it, 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 I mean, it, it, how, how are you call yourself? What what ism? Doesn't really matter. This ism, that ism, just matter. It's a, there's a core, core value or core energy. And then the first one is no harm. When you harm others, you know you you sort of like harm yourself too. And when others in pain, you also feel the pain. And so, so for me, becoming a vegetarian is very, very easy. I have no struggle. I just one day, okay, no more. <laughs> That's it. That was more than more than twenty years ago. Oh. All right. And so, do you guys want to? Uh, it was a struggle for me. I'm telling you, I love the place too much. <laughs> so you want to continue on the next word? So at verse one thirty one. So any anything else you, you guys want to bring up for this for the verse that we just read? All right. So Sanjay, you you like to read this? Start with this thirty one. Uh, my phone is a little small. I can't read it. Okay, I'll read. <laughs> Yeah, the screen is small. Okay. If they who do some good in thanks for favors once received are praised, why need we speak of bodhisattvas, those who freely benefit the world? Those who scornfully with condescension gave just once a single meal to others, feeding them for only half a day, are honored by the world as virtues. What need is there to speak of those who constantly bestow on boundless multitudes, the peerless joy of blissful Buddhahood, the ultimate fulfillment of their hopes? So verse 32 refers to the ending custom of formalizing giving. In if once a day, a week, a month, one gives meal to beggars, one is seen as a virtuous member of society. The Santi Deva addresses giving with an, with an agenda. Most of us living in cities with homeless people do this. We come up with a plan like giving to the first person who asks us in hope of relieving our guilt for the rest of the day. Of course, giving in this way is beneficial but we could definitely stretch further. When we give money to homeless men and women, we could aspire for them to be free of all their pain. We could aspire to extend our own comfort, comfort and happiness to them and to homeless people everywhere. Even more to the point, we could recognize how much we have in common and give freely without resentment or condescension. Even in the very early stages of practicing aspiration, bodhicitta, we can include all beings. If bestowing on boundless multitudes, the peerless joy of blissful Buddhahood seems a bit beyond you, just keep it real. When we get sick, for example, we don't usually think of the sickness of others, but the shift can happen. When you fall ill, you could think of others in the same boat. Even getting into a soothing bath could bring you out of your cocoon. Countless people don't have such comfort. People who are freezing and longing for warmth, people who are exhausted and have no way to relax, we can aspire for all beings to be free of their suffering and to enjoy the pleasure we ourselves enjoy. The last three verses address the proper treatment of a bodhisattva. Uh, I think I can read finish, then we can go back to discussion. So 34, and those who harbor evil in their minds against such lords of generosity, the Buddha's heirs will stay in hell. The mighty one has said for ages equal to the moments of their malaise. By contrast, good and virtuous thoughts 
will yield abundant fruits in greater measure. Even in adversity, the bodhisattvas never bring forth evil, only an increasing stream of goodness. To them in whom this precious secret mind is born, to them I bow. I go for refuge in the source of happiness that brings its very enemies to perfect bliss. In verse 34, we have the first mention of hell. As a child, I was taught that hell was the ultimate punishment. So this is where you were sent when you died, when you died, if you were really, really bad. I'm glad to report this isn't the, isn't the view here. To understand this reference from a Buddhist perspective, we look to cause and effect and the way we continually imprint our minds. We sow the seeds of our future health or happiness by the way we open or close our minds right now. This all-consuming health described graphically in many Tibetan texts do not exist apart from the minds of the beings who experience them. For instance, in his final dedication, Shantideva refers to those whose hell it is to fight and wound. The idea here is that when we intentionally harm another, particularly someone dedicated to benefiting others, the long-term consequences of our cruelty will be experienced as hellish outer circumstances. It is our own aggression that hurts us. It is not that we are punished and sent to hell. Hell is the manifestation of a vindictive mind. It is also important to understand what Shantideva means, but those who harbor evil in their minds, the key word here is harbor. Harboring hatred towards another produces an anguished frame of mind. We remain in this hellish state for ages equal to the moments of our wrath. In other words, for as long as we hold on to our hatred instead of letting it go. So virtuous thoughts, on the other hand, bring us happiness. Instead of separating us and making us feel more cut and afraid, they bring us closer to others. In verse 35, Shantideva says, that even in adversity, bodhisattvas bring forth only goodness. Frequently in times of adversity, we become afraid, striking out in anger or indulging in virtues, in various addictions, in hope of escaping our pain. Shantideva says that bodhisattvas let the suffering of adversity soften, soften them and to make them kinder. And that we could aspire to do the same. The Bodhisattva path takes some work. Our habitual patterns are very entrenched. Nevertheless, when hard times make us more selfish and withdraw, we could see this as our moment of truth. Transformation can occur right in this painful place instead of the evil of more neurosis and harshness Adversity can bring about humility and empathy. By bringing us to our knees, so to speak, it can tenderize, tenderize us and make us more capable of reaching out to others. In the last verse, Shantideva bows to all of us who are willing to awaken bodhicitta, and he bows to bodhicitta itself, the source of happiness that brings its very enemies to perfect bliss. Those closing words may seem to contradict verse 34 with its hellish consequences for those who act aggressively. But from the point of view of the awakened one, happiness can come even to those who harbor evil in their minds. As a result of our compassionate intentions, even our enemies can be liberated from self-absorption and thus attain enlightenment. Knowing where the roots of happiness lies save us from escalating pain. If someone insults you, for instance, you may long to retaliate, but you know this won't benefit anyone. 
Instead, in the very grip of wanting to get even, you can say to yourself, may the reach that I feel towards this person cause both of us to be liberated. This is the aspiration of a young Bodhisattva, one in the process of learning to let go. Even if we don't genuinely feel it, we are able to say, may this seemingly negative connection be our link to waking up. This is beautiful, don't you think? I love it. If I could say something, Nassau, can I share sure. some thoughts? Sure, go ahead. Okay, so what I was gonna say is, I think a lot of it is tied to maturity and awareness. And um, the, I don't know that hatred, if people understand, if it's tied into what is called the frustration aggression hypothesis, what that means is um, there could be somebody that's misguided with their uh, displacement, you know, this idea of projecting onto something. They may not really hate anyone, but what happens is they might hurt others to go along with the program. Underneath anger is hurt. So by addressing the hurt through maturity, compassion, you mentioned empathy, I think mm -hmm. it dissolves and the community can love that person back into wholeness. That person is already whole. And yes. I, I also think, have you noticed that if somebody is the parent's age, and they can empathize with how they were as a kid and they can be compassionate to others through that experience. And in that way, a lot of religious teachings teach this too, this pathway that salvation is already there. But I think understanding that the individual is dynamic, the soul journey is dynamic and not always static is helpful too, that they can it grow. Is. There is, it is, but wisdom and ignorance, they, they, can, they, they can, okay, nobody is just like, just being like, like a static, right? And so like, like you said, underneath that hatred, sometimes fear, fear and hurt. Right, and were, were they abused? Were they traumatized? What decisions did they have? You know, I know in my own mistake, um, mistakes I've made, like I've had to become aware of conduct that I wasn't aware of. And sometimes you have to have people pointing things out because people are doing things to fit in. They don't quite understand the impact they're having, right? And it's not due to um, necessarily that they're hating others in some cases. It's more of this idea of protective measures because it's a defense. So they'll, they'll kind of uh, lash back or just they, there's a sense of immaturity Maybe they're not feeling anyone's listening to them. So there's there's a lot that could be going on. I'm not trying to rationalize, mm -hmm. but it's if if we look at everything as a multi-dimensional kind of um, ecosystem, it can kind of also explain a lot in addition to the spiritual text. Yeah. So actually, I remember a story. So it is told by an activist. So one time, some someone just lashed out on her and say a lot of insulting things on her, and she, instead of like retaliating, right? So she just look at that person very calmly and she was silent for some seconds. And then she asked that person, where does it hurt? <laughs> and that person started crying. <laughs> yes, I just think incredible. The person was like one exactly. second ago was like insulting her. Then she just asked her, where does it hurt? Exactly. Yes, it, so where does it, it, it hurt? It, huh. Exactly. And then Ms. Zhao, another thing is, I know when I was a kid, I don't know how it was for anybody else. I might have said something or teased someone not understanding what I was doing. They said, why'd you say it? Because so-and-so said it, or I don't know. I didn't have a reason. There are times where I just did things out of immaturity and impulse, um, addictive tendencies that you talked about, but maybe not quite understanding the impact. I just did things to be liked, didn't really think about it. But now as I'm older, more uh, developed, you're able to see the errors in the way and notice what uh, the other gentleman said, other people that are listening, they have said the same thing, this idea of uh, accepting your whole life's journey. You gotta really go through, clean the conduct, the awareness, who, what, where, when, why, how, and just work with that greater awareness to be compassionate to yourself and others to make amends and kind of really appreciate that others have been there for you so you'll be there for them in similar situations. Yeah, so I like this aspiration too, right? So when some someone hurt you and some someone and do bad things to you. So instead of wishing that person harm, and you actually, so that that's what she's, she's using here, you actually also wish that person to be liberated from whatever the, the wrath, he's, from the hatred he's experiencing. So may you be free from this hatred. <laughs> and this is, may this seemingly negative connection be our link to waking up. So I, I think this is, is beautiful. 
So most people, when someone hurt hurt us, we want that person to have some something bad happen to them, right? Uh, yeah, I um can I add? Sure. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, for the um, uh, for the training of this bodhicitta, basically, um, there's two sides, right? So one side is um to make our mind uh, like bigger, uh, not just a very small, uh, like what Sanjay said, um, uh, to from multi dimension. It's like when your mind is bigger, and when you feel like uh, what you feel with other beings or animals and then you your mind is changing and then when our mind is bigger and soft and then you can understand from different angles why like some people hurt me or some people doing something I don't understand basically everyone have their reason and their reason is basically uh, underneath um, is like the habitual mind uh, from there karma sometimes in buddhism perspective we see the karma or what they did uh with uh, from this life yeah that's um what i want to share thanks Peter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah then here he gave a little elaboration on what hell means right so hell is not like a punishment that gets punishment done to you by other force as long as you harbor right one person harbor this hatred and that person who harbor that hatred will suffer. So for suffer from that mind. So I, I, li I like this saying too. So a lot of people when they say the word hell, they think it's like a physical place and it's, it's a punishment. Actually the punishment is not done to you by others, it's by yourself because you harbor those evil, uh, like evil thoughts in your mind. So you say harbor hatred. So harbor hatred, towards anyone produces an anguished frame of mind. So whenever that person have this hatred you know, in him, he cannot experience happiness. And so you can cause, cause yourself like anguishment, the anguish frame of mind. So that's, and that's why he says like, when you have this hatred in your mind, you actually, this is like the hellish state for yourself. So it's it's a matter of like state of mind. So Krish, what do you think? You have anything to add to this paragraph? Krish, you're there. I cannot see your face. Hi. I see a roof, <laughs> <laughs> a ceiling. Let me quickly. Go. Yeah, and also the adversity. I, I, I think this makes sense too. So when bad things happen to us, right? So when like when we had experiencing adversity, so our first response it called like a um, like a fight, freeze, or um, let me see, or do something to retaliate. You said yeah. uh, when, when yeah. bad things happen to us, and when hard time make us uh, more selfish and withdraw. I just want to, yeah, you just worry about, hey, I may not even have enough for myself. So make us more selfish. And then we could use that moment actually to transform. The transforming can occur right in the painful place. And yes, I think this is yeah, powerful I too. Always, hmm. I, I go with, I go with a, a teaching. Most people don't agree with me, but that's who I am. That's my teaching. Mm -hmm. dark side understand the dark side once you know your dark side dark places don't scare you you go there and do what you need to do what needs to be done that's so what most I do. people don't have the courage to face the dark side or to even to get into there to learn to know to understand you have to understand yourself when you understand yourself you know your dark sides you have to be comfortable with your dark sides Okay, I mean, you have your faults, but what are dark sides? Dark sides are my faults. Mm -hmm. I mean, own faults, which I'm failing to recognize, I'm failing to reconcile with. There are some faults I think, oh, I shouldn't be doing this this way. I shouldn't be doing it that way. I'm not good. I'm not, I'm not good. I'm not righteous. I mean, see, you see, you what you wanted to do that only for yourself. That's why they're saying you inside the mind that you are being selfish in even doing whatever that you're doing in a selfish manner. You know, that's the voice. 
that you need to try to silence. Why that tells you you are doing something selfish even in the middle of a selfless act is that voice of doubt. Mm-hmm. So uh, that is your that is your dark side. You know, seeing that you should you know your uh, guilty pleasures. You're aware yeah. aware of your dark side, right? You should be aware of it and embrace it. If you can't embrace it, is when we struggle to embrace it. We don't. We struggle to embrace it. We want things we think we shouldn't have, and then when we want those things that we shouldn't have, we feel like, oh, why should I not have it? And then that leads to to pangs of anxiety. You see, somebody else have it, mm-hmm. and say, why can't I have it? And then it comes to, you can't have it because you didn't work for it. Then you look back and say, I think I have worked for it. You see, and then, then you say, no, no, you didn't work for it the way we want you to work for it. All these dialogues and discussions happen. Somewhere you find uh, outrage. And that's where uh, you have got to embrace your dark side and say, this is what I deserve, this is what I have. I'll go for it no matter what. It's yeah, a lot of lot of work. I, I think so. Um, Pama Children have another book. So like talking about something like that, you 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 need to have the courage to face everything. And because most most people, we we just, when we see something, even even the dark side of ourselves, we want to just push it somewhere. We want to just hide it somewhere. We don't want to face that. Okay. Ultimately, this morning I told my wife. This is what I said to her. I said this to her. You know why I don't have any anxiety inside of me? I don't, I don't have any anxiety. So I don't have any anxiety. He said, like, how can you not have anxiety? I don't have any anxiety. And I said, why I don't have anxiety? Because I constantly believe, 100% I believe that everything I have done so far is right. Everything I've done so far is right. You, have, a done, you, have, a, you have done a lot of work, actually, to take care of your spirit. So that's where you're, where, that you are where you are now. You're just more peaceful than a lot of people. Yes, I'm not, well, I'm peace is controlled. I'm not at peace more than a lot of people. I have a storm brewing instead of me. I keep it under control. Yeah. That's that... The dark side is kept under control. It's kept under control. That's a required other practice too. Nobody knows, nobody knows anything about it. Nobody knows anything. <laughs> nobody should know anything about it. But you live peacefully with your dark side, right? Mine, my friend. Yeah, you don't want that. Yeah, so that's... Exactly. That's a work in the way of doing. Be aware and work with it. Live with it. I'm thank. This is where I belong, where I started and where I ended. I began mm-hmm. my life as an atheist. When I was five years old, I was an atheist. I told people there's no God. For my own parents, there's no God. Okay? And then I was the point of time I hated God the most. God was the guy I hated the most because I held him responsible for every problem in this world. Today, I'm you're, you're holding of, God responsible inside, inside of yourself. <laughs> today I'm holding myself responsible for all the problems by basically acknowledging that that you know I made peace with my worst enemy and now he has become my best friend. Well, it's a long, it's long mind journey. So maybe, maybe you should journal that and talk about like writing your journal, and then you can share that journey with others too and help others. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm coming to all these meetings for that some for that simple reason mm-hmm. is to share. And uh, I'd like to invite Sanjay to our group also, the tribes of spirituality. If you can please leave behind a phone number in the chat on sure on I can group. send it to I can send it right now and or I can give it to Miss Zhao and she can give it to whoever wants and I can put it Miss Zhao, can I put it here in the chat? Yeah, you can put it in the chat. We we we'd love to have you. <laughs> Be part of part of our study. Oh. Okay, let's see. So thank she- you. I'm learning so much from both of you and everyone else on the call. Um, Christina, Trish, and Ms. Zhao, I appreciate everyone. Uh, thank you. Thank you.